I thought it would be interesting to look at a piece being written now to see if Virginia Woolf's dream has been realized. Spoiler alert, it has not because women are still bitching about the issue, or rather feminists are. This Guardian article is called A Woman's Greatest Enemy? A Lack of Time to Herself. This was published a year ago, but I don't think much has changed on the feminist opinion on this topic. So this woman is describing that she was struggling to find time in her crowded days for writing, and she was directed to look at the daily rituals of great artists, but she basically saw that they were mostly men, and that they had the help of the women in their lives who protected them from interruptions, brought them meals, doted on them, that Martha Freud not only laid out Sigmund's clothes every morning, she even put the toothpaste on his toothbrush. Hey man, if you can get someone to do that for you. She mentions Gustav Mahler, who married a promising young composer named Alma and then forbade her from composing, saying there could be only one in the family. Instead, she was expected to keep the house utterly silent for him. And that Alma wrote in her diary about how miserable she was was wanting to find someone who thinks of me, who helps me to find myself. I've sunk to the level of a housekeeper. I mean, that sucks, but maybe she shouldn't have married another composer. Maybe she should have married someone where she would have been the only composer in the family. Like, what he says makes sense. Like, do you really want to be competing with each other in a certain sense? Girl, you married him. Was it a surprise? Did you not know what his personality was before you married him? I kind of doubt that. So she says that the female creative types who are mentioned had a very different life trajectory, their days were structured differently, that they were limited by the expectations and duties of home and care. George Sand always worked late at night. Francine Prose's writing day was defined by the departure and return of her children on the school bus. Alice Monroe wrote in the slivers of time she could find between housekeeping and child rearing, and that Maya Angelou checked herself into a hotel room to think, read, and write. She even cites one man, Anthony Trollope, who would write before 8 a.m. every day, but that he most likely learned the habit from his mother, who began writing at age 53 to support her six husband and their six children, that she rose at 4 a.m. and finished work in time to serve the family breakfast. Look, I know someone personally who is divorced, but he is a man and he shares joint custody and he has creative projects and aspirations. When does he do them? He does them in the morning because he's had to work a full-time job and then he has joint custody of the children. So he would get up early to work in the morning before he has to wake up the kids and then go to work. And then later he has to pick them up and then spend time with them and then he could do some work after they go to sleep. If he was a full-time creative, he could get work done while they're at school, but that's no different than what she just described as Francine Prose's life of writing between the school buses. So, you know, life has changed for men and women significantly, so it's not really about men or women. It again comes back to this issue of parenthood, of domestic life, and who has those responsibilities, whether they are men or women. She mentioned an interview Patty Shialfa gave on how difficult it was for her to write the music for her solo album because her kids kept interrupting her and demanding her time in a way they never would have of their father, Bruce Springsteen. And it struck her that it's not that women haven't had the talent to make their mark in the world of ideas and art. They've never had the time. Oh, please. Give me a fucking break. Again, this comes back to the issue of Gustav Mahler and his wife. If you have two artists in the family, that's a whole other issue. You're both trying to write music and you both want the artist's lifestyle. Well, you're going to have to compromise and negotiate. Hey, Patty, how about when you're trying to write music, you tell your husband, Bruce, that he needs to keep the kids, keep them away from you, keep them occupied, deal with them, parent them, that you need two hours, three hours, or you need like one day in the week to just work. That goes for every woman. You can't ask your husband for four hours on Saturday to work on your your novel or your music or whatever and have him take the kids to the park or to get ice cream or to play video games with them or catch in the backyard. Really? Really? I don't believe that. I think that one of the other problems is that maybe things have not progressed in the way that Virginia Woolf would have expected because of the way that parenting has changed, because of the expectations about this kind of like hovering parenting where like kids' lives are all planned and parents kind of let kids run their lives and have all these 
expectations of them. Whereas people that I know that are maybe like eight to 10 years older than me, especially the guys that I know of that age group described just going over to their friend's house and just being there for hours, running around in the woods. Well, because that has changed, like my husband had that kind of childhood. And so if his mother wanted to engage in creative work, she would have had plenty of time. You know, sure, she had some household duties like vacuuming or cleaning and things like that, but that wouldn't take her the entire day. And she'd have plenty of time while he's running around in the woods to do whatever. And it also depends what your expectations are of family togetherness time all the time, because if your family kind of goes their own way more, then it's not a big deal if you just go in the other room and you're working on a project. Whereas if the kids are expecting you to come do something with them. I mean, my family had a lot of togetherness, but we were plenty content to do our own thing. So if my mother had needed time to go work on something, like that wouldn't have been an issue. And my dad would have explained to us like, hey, don't bother mom, she's working on stuff. But my mom did not have those interests. And this writer goes on, women's time has been interrupted and fragmented throughout history. The rhythms of their days circumscribed by the Sisyphean tasks of housework, childcare, and kin work, keeping family and community ties strong. If what it takes to create are long stretches of uninterrupted, concentrated time, time you can choose to do with as you will, time that you can control, that's something women have never had the luxury to expect, at least not without getting slammed for unseemly selfishness. And here we go. Women can't deal with judgment from other people. Yeah, if you take some time to yourself, maybe people aren't gonna like it, but tough shit, deal with it. And I think Virginia Woolf would have the same comment to this woman that she did to the women at the college she was speaking to, that like, you're talking about the past. You're talking about what women had to deal with in the past. You don't have those problems. Your housework takes you not that much time with all the fucking modern conveniences that you have. It's important to you to keep family and community ties strong. That's why you do it. And you can't have it all. You can't just have these long stretches to just do whatever you want all the time. And it's not like men do either. Like ask any dad, and I know lots of dads, they do not have those long stretches of uninterrupted concentrated time, at least not when their kids are young. As your kids age, it's a totally different ballgame. Now she's making the same point that feminists always make that even though women are working too, they're still doing more of the housework. And I'm like, whose fault is that? Talk to your husband, negotiate on the housework. It's probable that more women are working part-time hours. And so it makes sense that they do more of the housework or it bothers them more when things aren't clean at a certain level in a certain amount of time. But if they want to, they can do what my husband's mother did at one point. She went on strike and she said, I'm tired of doing all this stuff. I'm tired of cooking for you guys all the time and cleaning all the time. Like you guys are going to do that stuff, which is something that my mother did too. At a certain point, she taught us how to make food, basic stuff. So when she went to work in the evenings, we were cooking for ourselves. We could fend for ourselves. We, we could make our own lunches. We could do our own laundry, clean the bathrooms, vacuum, etc. So yeah, when your kids are really, really young, they can't do that. But any woman who's complaining about this stuff, who has a child who's like eight or older, I have no sympathy for because you are not using your unpaid child labor to its best advantage. She talks about this comparison of male academics to female academics, that they had longer days because of the unpaid labor at home. Like, yes, people have to keep their homes clean and like take care of the household and they don't get paid by anyone else for doing it. Tough shit. Otherwise, everything would just go to shit. That's just how it is. But she says that women's time at work was also interrupted more than men's because it was chopped up with more service work, mentoring, and teaching. Why is that? Why don't women say no to that? Maybe they like mentoring more. Maybe they like teaching more. Maybe they like being helpful. It's possible they have a hard time saying no, but that's another issue that could be solved. Women could get assertiveness training, but first you'd have to admit that men and women are different and that women might need certain kind of assistance that men don't. Feminists don't want to admit that women maybe aren't as assertive naturally as men. It's just that men are keeping them from being assertive, you know? Totally makes sense. She mentions feminist researchers saying that women have had invisible leisure, that they have these socially sanctioned activities like quilting bees, canning parties, or book groups. But making time for oneself is nothing short of a courageous act of radical and subversive resistance. Like, oh my god, maybe women like spending time in groups. I know this from personal experience. They like book groups. They like knitting circles. They like spending time with other women and being part of groups. It weirds me out, but it's true for the average woman. Take an hour for yourself to read a book. Who's stopping you? 
you, the middle class women reading this fucking article, nothing is stopping you. But here we get to the crux of the issue, where she says feminist researchers have also found that many women don't feel they deserve long stretches of time to themselves the way men do. They feel they have to earn it. And the only way to do that is to get to the end of a to-do list that never ends. Yeah, men get time to themselves, but most of them are working a full-time job. They're busting their ass, earning the money that keeps the women in the lifestyle to which they are accustomed. So yeah, men earn it all day. If you're a woman who works also, then have a conversation with your husband about divvying up the housework. My parents had that conversation, and they're not exactly modern and woke. But if you don't work full-time, if you work only part-time, or if you are the stay-at-home person, then yeah, you need to earn your alone time by getting shit done, unless you have an arrangement with your spouse otherwise. So this chick writes about how she's been trying to write this essay for months, and every single time I've sat down to start, I've gotten a panicked call or email from my husband, son, or daughter, my mother, dealing with the strange frontier and endless paperwork of the newly widowed, a credit card company, or a mechanic about some emergency or other that requires my immediate attention to stave off certain disaster. And I'm like, dude, you have a husband. Tell him that this is on my calendar. I'm writing for these two hours. Only bother me if it's a fucking emergency. Otherwise, give me these two hours. Go watch a movie with the kids. Do not answer your phone. Put it on Do Not Disturb. Do not look at your email for two hours, okay? You don't need to look at the email from your credit card company. You don't need to take the mechanics call. I really doubt it requires your immediate attention. Maybe there's something psychological in women that makes it really hard for them to say no or to turn off their brain that's always worrying about stuff. But that's what you gotta do. You gotta focus and you gotta make that time for yourself. And if it means other people think you're a little selfish or not as responsive, then deal with that. It's the trade-off for getting that time to yourself. Nothing comes for free. She also raises the issue that Virginia Woolf raised, referencing this writer V.S. Nepal, who claimed that no woman writer was his match, that women's writing is too sentimental, their worldview too narrow. Because, you know, men's lives are the default for the human experience experience. And she says, I've often wondered, would a woman who'd written a carefully observed six-volume novel based on her own life have received the same attention and international acclaim as the Norwegian writer Carl Ove Nossegaard, author of My Struggle? I don't know. Maybe she should write it, and then we'll find out. So then she references Wolf's idea of Shakespeare's sister, and how she imagined in the future, woman with genius would be born, and she would be able to blossom if we created the right kind of conditions, the right kind of world. And just like all their fucking feminists, Feminists, she gets super dramatic at the end, saying, I do not claim to have any particular genius, but sometimes I dream that I'm sitting in a dusky room at a kitchen table across from another version of me who sits unbound by time, quietly drinking a cup of tea. I wish you'd visit more often, she tells me, and I wonder if that searing middle of the night pain that at times settles like dread around my solar plexus may not only be because there's so little unbroken time to tell my own untold stories, but because I'm afraid that what may be coiled inside may not be worth paying attention to anyway. Perhaps that's what I don't want to face in that dusky room I dream of. <laughs> yeah, bitch, maybe you're not that interesting. Like most fucking people in the goddamn world. I'm glad that the thought at least fucking occurs to you. I also wonder, she continues, what if we really did do the work to create a world where the sisters of Shakespeare and Mozart, or any woman really, could thrive? What would happen if we decided women deserved the time to go to their dusky rooms and stay a while at the kitchen table? What if we all decided to visit more often, drinking a quiet a cup of tea with ourselves, listening to the coil of stories as they unspool, knowing they have value simply because they're true. I love to see what happens next. Jesus, this is why I can't like deal with most feminists, the kind of women that write shit like, let's sit with ourselves more and drink tea with ourselves. Like, please kill me. Do you think that time is just handed to men on a platter? There's like the god of time and he was like, you're a man, here, have an unbroken stretch of time to be creative. No, they carved that time for themselves or they married someone who was willing to help them have that time, who was willing to take care of them and nurture them. Maybe you're a woman who's not that nurturing and domestic and you know what, that's fine, but own that. Negotiate with your husband like a fucking adult for what you need. Oh, but you won't. You just expect everything to be handed to you. You expect people to just understand what you want intuitively. No, use your words, bitch. Ah, <sighs> so that's it. I kind of just wanted to address this topic of women in the creative field. This is a seminal feminist complaint that dates all the way back to Virginia Woolf. I'm sure I could go on about it for a lot more, but this is where I will leave you. Thank you for watching. If you 
like this video, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe. And I hope to have more content for you very soon.